I wanted to start by uh, just making the statement that uh, we are on Ohlone land and the Ohlone are the, the uh, original inhabitants of this area and still the inhabitants of this area and still an important presence in what happens here in this place. Uh, my name is Cynthia Kaufman and I'm the director of the Vasconcelos Institute for Democracy and Action at De Anza College, which is a community college in the South Bay right near here. Um, uh, we also have Dorian Warren, the president of Community Change and Community Action and the co-chair of the Economic Security Project and you got to know him this morning and Quinton Sankofa, who's the co-director of the uh, movement generation uh, based here in Oakland. Um, here, what we're talking about here is an economics of belonging. We're going to hear from uh, these two as speakers. I'm going to make a few short comments after they speak, and then we're going to do a little bit of a small group uh, conversation amongst yourselves, and then a kind of a, a plenary conversation where you can direct questions or comments up to the front or to each other. Um, and I just wanted to start by saying that, you know, the theme of this conf conference is uh, about othering and belonging. And I would say that we live in a society where belonging is incredibly hard for people from a variety of marginalized communities. And I would also say, given the economic situation, that uh, with a, I would say, capitalism as a dominant economic force in our society and, in, and globally, that capitalism makes it hard for anybody to belong. That there's, there, there's some really important dynamics with capitalism that undermine belonging for everybody. Um, we're also going to be we're going to be looking at what changes need to be made to build an economy of belonging. Um, and I would say one of the things I was happy about this morning is kind of where it ended with that question that they kind of threw into our lap about what is our vision for a society of belonging, and that's both a vision for sort of a society culture of belonging, but also an economics of belonging. What 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 do we think? And I'm hoping that the work we do here this morning is going to help us really understand that better. And because all three of us are actually organizers, I hope that we're going to look at what it's going to take to actually, as Dorian ended this morning, talk about what it's going to take to sort of tear down the old uh, economics that, that does not have belonging, what's going to help us envision that new economics of belonging, and then what are we going to actually do as organizers to build that. Um, and then we're going to start with, um, with Quinton. Good morning, everybody. You all are a beautiful group of people. Uh, I am very happy to be here with you all today. Again, my name is Quentin Sankofa. I am one of the co-directors of Movement Generation, the Justice and Ecology Project. Uh, and so in this presentation, I have about 15 minutes, and I have way more than 15 minutes of information. So we're going to try and get to, <laughs> through this together. Um, but I think some of the stuff I have supplementary uh, may sneak in, may not. Um, I'll say just a little bit about who Moving Generation is, and then I'm going to get into some of the core frames that we present um, around economy, around pillars of economy, extractive economies, regenerative economies, uh, and the Just Transition Framework. Um, and so the slide that you have up in front of you right now, oh, and just the name, uh, Moving Generation, we're sponsored by the Movement Strategy Center. Uh, so you can find us here in Oakland. We also have an office out in uh, Berkeley and South Berkeley. Uh, we are a flat organization, a flat nonprofit. Uh, it's eight of us, and we uh, pretty much manage the organization together. Um, and so it gives us a tremendous ability to practice um, some of the values that we would like to see in other workplaces around shared governance and leadership and decision making. Um, uh, primarily, we work with activists and organizers and other change makers uh, across a variety of different uh, movement sectors. Um, and uh, one of the key things that we do is we help folks understand the ecological crisis. Uh, some people call it climate change. We talk about it as an ecological crisis and climate change being one of the parts of that crisis. Um, and we also work with folks to understand strategy on how to move us from the economy of extraction to an economy of uh, regeneration. Um, another way to think about it is moving from uh, an economy based on banks and tanks to one based on cooperation and caring. Uh, one of the core things that we do to, um, to help our folks is we hold three to five day strategy retreats. Um, at these strategy retreats, if we're doing them uh, here in the Bay Area, we'll usually do them up at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, uh, which is in Sonoma County. By show of hands, how many folks are uh, coming from someplace in California? By show of hands. Okay, a lot of Californians here. That's great. How many folks are coming from outside the state? Oh, damn. Okay. Wow. Okay. So people are coming from in California and outside of California. Do I have anybody in here from the Midwest? All right. Anybody here from Cleveland? Oh, uh, just me? Okay. That's cool. 
but yeah, originally I'm from Cleveland, okay? Um, but I'm really happy that uh, a lot of different folks are here um, because I feel like that's where we get a lot of uh, creativity and energy when we are able to come together in these different spaces and get out of our traditional uh, bubbles. Um, so yeah, so we offer these strategy retreats and we usually do them over five days and they're pretty heavy. We start by exploring the ecological crisis um, and we really sit with that grief. We look at the numbers, we look at the science, um, and we sit with the grief of what's happening in our ecosystems. Uh, and then we work <clears throat> to develop strategies and explore strategies on how to shift things uh, for our people. We also offer various programs. Uh, it's very important for us to not just be analytical and thinking about these issues. We like to get into the world and practice different solutions and strategies. So we offer uh, courses like our Earth Skills course or our Permaculture for the People course. The slide that you see behind me uh, on the right side, I believe, is our 2010 retreat. I was a member of that retreat um, that year. That's when I met Movement Generation. And it literally changed the course of my, uh, uh, of my, my work and my politics. Uh, I was looking for a place where I could talk about ecological justice and what was happening in our planet alongside all the social, economic, racial, gender, sexuality, all of these other topics. Uh, and Movement Generations Retreat was a place where I found people were trying to talk about all these things together. Um, and so, uh, let's see here. I think this works. Yeah, okay, cool. So um, uh, we consider ourselves grassroots ecologists, okay? I wasn't trained as an ecologist, um, but we study ecology in order to make meaning and sense of the world and how it applies to our social movements. Uh, and so today I wanna talk to you a little bit about ecology, economy, ecosystems. And we'll start with this. And just to be um, transparent, I'm moving through this stuff really fast. I usually don't do it, but I only got 15 minutes. And I usually do this more participatory, but it's like 100 of y'all. Um, <laughs> so we can't do that right now, so my apologies. Um, I do have um, some Just Transition zines here. This is a, a little booklet that we put together to kind of go more in depth into some of the things I'm talking about. So I only have a handful. I have a couple in Spanish too. So if you want to get a little more flavor, um, then after the session, just come up and I can give you one of these. Okay, so let's get into it. So eco. Eco is a very popular word right now, but we wanted to get into the roots of this word and where did it come from and what did it mean, right? Um, does anybody in here know the origins of the word eco? Like what language that it comes from? Thank you, oikos. It's a Greek, it, it comes from a Greek word, oikos or echos. Um, and you see that in like Greek yogurts and stuff like that at your supermarket, right? But what does it mean, right? What does this word mean? We see it everywhere. And it's important for us to understand that eco simply means home. That's what it means. It means home, okay? And so we'll go through a couple of things to um, explore more about home and this meaning. Eco and logi put together. Logi is the study of things, the knowledge of things, like biology is the study of life or the knowing of life. So ecology is the knowledge or understanding of home. Okay, that's very important to know. It's the understanding of home. Ecosystem. System um, uh, in, this, in this way means together. The different parts that make up home is your ecosystem. And the ecosystem can be as big as the entire planet, or it can be as small as a drop of water. It all depends on where you draw the, uh, the, the boundaries of what you're inquiring in or looking at or observing. So ecosystems are very important and very uh, uh, malleable and um, diverse. So that, that brings us to economy, right? And when we think of economy, what are the first things that come to mind when I say the word economy? Just shout them out real quick. Money, what else? That's it, huh? It's money. <laughs> what about Wall Street? Derivatives, stock exchange, commerce, clause, all of these things, right? Capital. Capital. And what are our feelings when we say economy? Do we have yeah. good feel? Bad, right? Ooh, economy. It doesn't feel good to us. I wonder why, right? So let's get into it, right? So economy, that word eco alongside nomi. And nomi means management, right? Like taxonomy is the management of the classification of different, uh, different animals. But put together uh, with eco, economy means simply management of home, okay? And so there's been a concerted effort to disconnect you and I from this management of home, right? But it's very simple. Economy just means management of home. And so at Movement Generation, we're very interested in this idea of ecological justice. Um, that is justice based on the right relationship and understanding of home and how to manage home in a proper way. But unfortunately, the economy that we have right now, the global, industrial, mostly capitalist economy, has led to a mismanagement of home, a global mismanagement of home. And that puts us into a, 
ecological disruption. So disconnecting us from our ability to know home, manage home, and understand home. It's heavy what's happening right now with this mismanagement of home, okay? We are in the midst of, um, some people would say, the sixth great uh, species extinction. We know about dinosaurs going extinct. We know about other species going extinct. And extinction is a part of evolution. It is a natural thing. It happens. The problem with the level of extinction we're facing right now is that it's unprecedented in the, in the speed at which it's happening. It's unprecedented in the amount of life that will go extinct. We're, we're, we stand to lose up to 90% of all living things on this planet, all living species on this planet if we continue down this road. And this extinction is the only extinction that was caused by a single species. Who's that species? Us, okay? So we are in a different moment in time. And this, this ecological disruption or this mismanagement of home has impacts all over. Some of the impacts that we explore are impacts on the energy, our biological and cultural diversity, land, labor, and migration, food and agriculture, waste and toxins. These are some of the lenses that we will go through a little bit more in depth at our strategy retreat. But today, I'm just gonna say a little bit about water. Water is life, no doubt, right? Water is sacred. This is our hydro hydrologic cycle, right? The way that water moves through our um, ecosystem. And I wanna be clear and say this to you all. You know this, but let's just put it into perspective. Water is sacred, water is life. Every drop of water that is on our planet has been here since the beginning. And there is no more water coming. All the water we have now is all the water we ever had. It's just constantly moving through various cycles from evaporation, condensation, to precipitation. So there's no new water coming. This is all we have to work with. And we've been blessed or very fortunate as a species to have water in this way. We can think about water in these ways. The earth is 75% water. My friend at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, Brock Dolman, he says, we don't actually live on planet earth. We live on planet water, right? Your body's mostly water, just like the earth is. Now, only two and a half percent of all the water on this planet is fresh water. Only two and a half percent. And that's the water that we need as a species to survive. Only one percent of that fresh water is easily accessible to us. A lot of it is trapped in glaciers, in snow fields. That's all fresh water. Side note, as the oceans warm and climate change warms our planet, glaciers are melting. That's fresh water being converted into salt water, okay? So only 1% is easily accessible to us. And unfortunately, half of what we have access to has already been polluted. So this is where we're at. This is part of that mismanagement of home. The waters didn't come to us polluted. They came to us pure. And through this economy, they've been seriously contaminated and polluted. Now, in order to transform the economy that got us to this place, and we can name it capitalism if we want, we can name it a lot of things. We like to call it extractive, the extractive economy. In order to transform our economy, it's gonna help us to understand some basics about the structures of economies, to break it down, to be real simple about it, because it's not that hard. Again, if economy means management at home, I think we all can manage home together. It's a daily practice that all of us have to do in order to show up in these places. You have to manage home. And usually you're managing home and a set of relationships associated with home. And so let's look at some basic pillars or components of all economies. So all economies have resources. And a side note too, again, I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to go quick. Language matters, and we're trying to dance with this capitalist, Eurocentric, limited language, because it's the language that we have in this country. But it is very limited. And so 
the framework that we're working in looks at resources as something to be managed. A lot of our folks in uh, our ancestral and indigenous communities don't look at them as resources, right? Like things to take. They look at them as life sources, things to interact with. So that's just a side note on my language, okay? So I'm gonna use this language because it's one that I think we can all have the common understanding about. So we have resources. We, in any economy, you take resources, you combine them with some form of work towards some purpose. Now, you also need some type of a worldview or culture that helps make sense to participate in it. And underlying all economies is some governance system, some way to facilitate the process. So that's just basic economic stuff. No matter what economy you're looking at, a capitalist economy, socialist economy, underground economies, political economies, care economies, all types of ways of managing home can be viewed in this way. It's not the only way, but it's one that we find simple and useful for our purposes. Now, let's take a look at where we are now. A lot of us are familiar with what we would call the extractive economy, and this is why we call it extractive. The way that we obtain resources in our current economy is through extraction. We dig up things, we burn things, and we dump things all over the planet. That is how we get and use resources in this economy. We combine that with a certain form of work. That form of work is exploitation. Under most people's desires, they, they do not wake up in the morning wanting to cause destruction on the planet. They do not wake up in the morning and say, hey, I would like to go drill a, a well in the middle of the ocean for oil. It's a very dangerous, polluting type of job. But because we live in an exploitative economy, people are forced through coercion and, I would argue, violence to participate in that way. And for what? For what? The purpose of this economy that we are currently in is the concentration of wealth and power. It can be said that the purpose of our economy is something else, to create jobs, to create the pursuit of life and liberty. But only, the only way you can understand a system is by what it produces, the outcomes of it. So no matter what we say about the economy, what it produces is a concentration of wealth and power. And you need a worldview to make this make sense to participate in. Part of that worldview is the myth of white supremacy. And understand what I'm saying, not white supremacy. There is nothing supreme about white people. It is a myth called white supremacy that many people buy into. And I would argue that that myth says that white people, specifically white males, are superior to other people, to the environment, and I would argue to life itself. That's what we're dealing with, okay? Now, what kind of governance structure do we need to facilitate this? one that is based on militarism, milita uh, militarism and violence. Make no mistake about it. If you do not participate in this economy, you will be met with violence. If you cho if, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna use the word choose here just for the illustration, but if you choose to say, hey, I don't wanna be a, a, a renter or owner. I'm gonna go into the park and I'll put a tent there and I'll live there in a very simple life every day. You will be met with violence. You will be removed. Unfortunately, people are not choosing to do that. People are forced on the streets right now and when they get on the streets, they are met with violence when they're just trying to find a place to exist because they have not participated in this economy. Okay, so we wanna move to a regenerative economy and so I wanna give you a flavor of what that looks like and then I'm gonna uh, close. So the regenerative economy, if we want to build a new economy, we have to think of it in our minds first, right? So in a new economy, in a different economy, in a regenerative economy, what would it look like? How can we build it? Well, where we get our resources from will be through regeneration, working with the natural systems of, uh, of life and how life functions. This requires us to have great eco-literacy. We have to be able to understand our watersheds, our food sheds, our bioregions, how the system actually functions in and of itself, not a control system, okay? Combined with what type of work? Cooperation, right? So we need to see folks having more power in their workplaces to decide what they do. The value that we bring as a species is around our work and our energy. That's what we bring to the web of life. We bring our work, our energy, and our culture. Towards what purpose? In this economy, our purpose must be ecological and social well-being. That has to be the reason why we get out the bed every day. That has to be the reason why we confront conflict. That has to be the reason why we make decisions because we're moving towards ecological and social well-being. Now, what kind of worldview do you have to have to, for this to make sense? You have to have one that's rooted in caring and sacredness. 
or we could say belonging. We have to believe that everybody belongs and everybody matters if we're gonna have this type of an economy. And what's gonna facilitate this process? Deep democracy. I'm not talking about the kind of democracy that we have now that allows a president like Donald Trump to be elected. I'm talking about the type of democracy that we have where everyone's voice matters and power is shared and decision making is made on the level at which it impacts the people the most. Those are the people who are making that decision, okay? So again, I went through this very quickly and I do believe my time is up, uh, but I just wanted to give you a little flavor of kind of how we think about this. Thank you. I don't have anything to add. I, like, <laughs> I should just scrap what I was gonna say. Uh, so I'm gonna build off of what you just said, Quentin, if that's okay, because I just learned a whole bunch of stuff. So I was taking notes, and um, so I'll offer maybe a couple of additions to what Quentin just laid out. And the way I come at this question about what kind of economy are we trying to build, and I'll come back to what I mean by that, I think about actual workers. Um, I see Jerry Hudson in the room, who is a teacher and mentor, so I'm quite inspired by his years of experience organizing workers, and especially workers of color. And I think we have to think about the different categories of workers that help us understand exclusion and exploitation in the current economy, in the extractive economy. So I think of immigrant workers, I think of women workers, and especially women of color workers. I think of black workers. And I think about questions of what kind of work and what industries and what places are people currently in or not working. And that takes you to different places depending on who you're looking at. And all the thing that unites all these groups of workers is that none of them belong in a sense. Almost everyone is excluded or exploited. And so what I want to get to is the idea, I like regenerative economy. I have this idea of a solidarity economy that's quite different. It involves cooperation and regeneration. But that's not obviously what we have right now because when you look at these groups of workers, whether it's women, immigrants, black workers, formerly incarcerated, these are all people who don't belong, but in very particular ways. So if we think about othering and exclusion, it's slightly different from othering and exploitation. So here's what I mean by that. If you think of women, as a category, just bear with me. So what we know in our economy and for most of the history of the world is the exploitation of unpaid labor. The exploitation of unpaid labor, of reproductive labor, of effective labor, of care labor. We can call it all sorts of things. But what we know is women who were excluded from the formal economy, once they were included in a formal sense, they were still the unpaid reproductive labor. Right? So this is what was called in the 80s the double shift for the first wave of women, right? That formerly were in the workforce and then they come home and work a double shift. That's unpaid, right? So we have to keep in mind that exclusion is different from exploitation. So in some cases, and especially women of color, who again might have been excluded from workplace protections but they were being exploited with unpaid labor in lots of cases. So think about another category, think about immigrant workers in the US and undocumented immigrants who are also othered and have no rights and who are plainly exploited in the formal and informal economy. Whether it's wage theft, whether it's simply fear to prevent organizing and the building of power to change conditions. So there's incredible exploitation even if especially undocumented workers are included technically in the economy, right? So it's a different, you have to think about it slightly differently. Or if I think about especially returning citizens, formerly incarcerated black workers, there's something different going on there because that's not necessarily the exploitation of workers, of black workers in the same way. It's profit from non-laboring bodies in mass incarceration in the system of mass incarceration. It's a bit different than how we used to, what we used to do with black bodies. They were exploited. Now, 
bodies, black bodies are exploited in a different way. Some who are able to work are exploited at the workforce. Others who are not able to work are profited upon for not working. Right, you understand where I'm going with this? So we just have to, we have to be, I think, careful in terms of understanding analytically who's excluded, who's included, who's exploited, and who's profited from under the current rules of the economy. So another way to say that is capital profits from exploitation, capital profits from exclusion in cages, and in the case of formerly incarcerated, in terms of the question of who belongs, there is social and economic death once people leave the cage. So they're permanently excluded, and the question is, how do we transform those relationships of both exclusion and exploitation? Okay, so let me go to what is the alternative, and I'll come to Quentin's point about governance of economies, because the way I see the world, the economy or economies are simply a set of rules, simply a set of rules and norms and practices that are written. Set of rules. It's kind of simple. The question and the hard question is written by whom? Who writes the rules that govern the workplace is the question of power that goes back hundreds of years. And that's what we're faced with in this moment. My friend Natalie Foster, who's in the room, likes to say that rules and policies are nothing but power frozen in a moment in time. Rules and policies is power frozen in time. So the question for me is how do we then rewrite the rules? We've done so before. We've done so in workplaces all over the country, but we need that power to do that. Because right now, and some of you heard me in the earlier panel on authoritarianism, the most authoritarian institutions in America are the workplace, under law, under the rules. There is no democracy at the workplace. The boss is the authoritarian dictator. We have at-will employment. That is the rule. You don't get to decide if you get hired or fired. You have no say in that. That's not a democracy. That's an authoritarian dictatorship. And we have accepted this in our economy and our workplace since the founding of this country. In fact, we inherited it from British feudalism. We have remnants of feudalism in 2019 in every workplace in this country. So how do we rewrite those rules? How do we bring economic democracy, deep democracy, to the last institutions in this country that are authoritarian to the workplace? That is the challenge in front of us. And I would submit that an alternative vision is a solidarity economy or a regenerative economy. We can, we can brainstorm the concept and the names, but the idea here is that this is an economy where everyone belongs, where everyone has power, where the dignity of labor is upheld for all, where the power of workers is at least equal to the power of capital, at least, and where we fundamentally redefine the meaning and definition of work. And to redefine the meaning and definition of work, we have to redefine also the meaning and definition of leisure. Hmm. 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 You have to redefine the meaning and definition of leisure. Jerry, what was the old labor movement saying? Eight hours a day for what? <laughs> eight hours a day for work, eight hours a day for rest. What was the third eight hours? <laughs> what was rest and sleep? There's a third. Play, joy, life, <laughs> leisure, roses with the bread. We can't ignore leisure in the equation when we talk about work and we want to redefine work. Ultimately, a solidarity economy starts with an assumption that all our fates are linked, that all our fates are linked, that in the old labor movement saying an injury to one is truly an injury to all. Underneath that, right, are notions of care and empathy 
But to achieve a vision of a solidarity economy, we actually need the power to do it. And so I hope that we can talk in the next little while around not just the vision of the economies that we want to create, but the strategy to build the power to do so. Thank you. whatever thought you were in the middle of, not throwing out any new ones. Okay, if you hear my voice, clap once. If you hear my voice, clap twice. You're such a cooperative crew. All right. Thank you so much. There was so much happiness and excitement in the room. I hate, it was hard to, to, to stop y'all. That seemed really good. Okay, so anything anybody wants to throw out of any kind? More leisure. <laughs> More leisure. All right. Yeah. Political and economic inequity is foundational to all of the oppressions, which is why we're here. Because unless we acquire power, we can't use the power. Anybody want to respond to that or say anything? That's right on. Okay. <laughs> good, 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 good. Yeah. I had a question come out of my interaction with Mary Margaret, and that is this idea of authoritarian workplace. How have we come to believe that in the United States of America, our foundation is such that we are this Christian nation, family is the centerpiece of everything we do, yet we have some of the most hostile public Answer that or, or add to it? One is, you know, we are living through a time every single day where outrageous things happen every day and we are numb and it's normalized, right? And it, it's not just Trump, let me be clear, but he's exacerbated and magnified outrageous things that are normalized. So, I mean, one way, to, the, the way to think about it is I think what's the, one of the biggest dangers is when othering becomes normal. And so that seems to be baked in from the very start of this country. And so it, it's so normal, and when I say the workplace is the most authoritarian institution in America, like it's a little jarring because we've accepted a myth that it's something else. When all along it has always been that. And if the first workplaces were based on unfree labor <laughs> and indentured servitude, that's how we start. So it's normal. We've come to expect when we walk to work, democracy no longer holds. Because we've actually rarely have had democracy ever in the workplace, ever. We have little moments in history. Some workers want some power to like change the rules. But for the most part, we have always existed in a feudal authoritarian set of workplaces in this country. And I, so I, I say that on purpose to kind of shake us from, you know, last thing is we can have a whole democratic tradition and a tradition of authoritarianism and they're not mutually exclusive. They can coexist. And that's the history of America, right? Of deep, right? That's, that's why Frederick Douglass fought and didn't leave. 
Does he believe in the struggle? And he believed in some of the ideals of the American promise. You can see this in Dr. King's March on Washington speech. Read the beginning, not the end. Read all the stuff before he gets to the drain part. Because that's the searing critique of the so-called ideals. So I just want to suggest we have always been a contradictory country that has been simultaneously aspirational around democracy for some people who belong and authoritarian on the other side. Right? So you just frame the world that we live in, what, what it's rooted in, and then we talk about a just transition, and definitely some organizations are, are leading the way and creating entirely different systems, smaller systems and all that. But a lot of us work in this yeah. larger system that's rooted in all these horrible things. So what does the just transition look like when we have to use the same tool sometimes to get to where we think we want to. Quentin, do you want to take that one? I'll take it too. I'll get Quentin yeah. go first, though. Um, <laughs> thank you for that uh, question. Uh, I mean, to me, uh, it's really about like, how do we see our way forward from where we are, right? Like you're standing in the forest and how do you uh, see the trees, right? Or you're standing among a tree and how do you see the whole forest? Uh, it's, I won't say it's easy, um, but I would say it's beautiful. It's like, we have to really return to our humanity and really remember like and i think that's why like the climate crisis is 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 the thing for us to all look at because it's the thing that will remind us of our humanity like the hurricanes don't care they don't care who you are where you are what your religious beliefs are what your political ideologies are it's coming for everybody now there are certain people who can uh mitigate the impact a little bit but they're gonna lose too the folks who lost their houses in the wildfires, there's a lot of folks who had money. It was a lot of poor people too, but there's a lot of folks who had money who thought that they were protected, right? No, it's not, it doesn't work like that, okay? Um, and so I think really it's about really getting back to our humanity. And I'll just say this, like, we're just in that moment right now where we have to dream and imagine something bigger because we are in the thick of it right now. We are in a, in a time of historic inequality. We're a time of, of global oppression. I mean, this is, a, this is a bad, bad situation that we're facing. Um, and so what I want to remind us of is this. Our ancestors who were enslaved and our ancestors who experienced genocide in this land, in this land over hundreds of years, they found themselves in a certain situation like this where they couldn't see the end of the system. They had the folks who were in the middle of it. Let's think about the folks who were in the 1700s who for hundreds of years, this transatlantic slave trade and the theft of indigenous land and the genocide had been going on for hundreds of years. They had no reason to believe that it was gonna stop. It was not designed to stop. This is supposed to be forever. Don't get it twisted. When the folks created the transatlantic slave trade, it wasn't for a moment in time. They wanted to fundamentally reshape the story of humanity. That was the objective. It was supposed to last forever. And so for our people who were caught up hundreds of years in it, and it wouldn't end for another hundred or so years, what was their orientation to that moment in time? Their moment, in, that orientation was to fight, and to st they still got up, they still had relationships, they still found a way to love each other, they still found a way to laugh, to sing, to cry together, to have rituals and ceremonies, to find their little spaces. They would go outside of the plantation in the forest and have their ceremonies where they could practice their indigenous ways. And a lot of that is what gave them the resilience to, to survive and thrive so that they continued to fight. And ultimately, they destroyed that system. Ultimately, I'm not a slave right now in that sense. I'm nobody's property in that sense because they destroyed that system. So we have to understand that we are winning this fight. We are not losing this fight, but it's going to take a long time. But we're not losing. We're winning this fight, and it's just gradual. So let's just keep that fight going. And I, I just wanted to add it. I'm not going to say it is inspiring as that, so maybe I should have ended there. But I did want to. I did, but I still wanted to add, add something in there, which is when we think about the transition again. Uh, uh, you know, there's the metaphor of the system that needs to be overthrown, which I think is not helpful so much as the metaphor of the fabric that needs to be rewoven, mm. right? So wherever we are, all where we are, you have to think about like what are those those deep threads that need to be changed. And so I feel like you know, sure, if if you're working in capitalist wage labor 
you know, work on your union and things like that, but also you've got the rest of your life, right? You've got yourself as a political being, a social being, a cultural being. You've got all those different aspects of your life to make those changes. And I know that I've been interested in this for a long time when it seemed like, yeah, those are great ideas, but nothing's going to happen about that. All of us in this room do not have that problem, right? We're in a time where the change is happening, and it's actually happening fast, right? Terrible things and also really good things. And so it seems to me that it's important for us to think big, to be visionary, and for uh, and to throw down wherever you can, right? Like wherever you live, get get the Green New Deal stuff going on, you know, get some cooperatives going. And I think worker-owned cooperatives are really important for the thing that Dorian was saying earlier about the. Um, you know, we can't even imagine democracy in the workplace. Well, some of us can, right? Quentin works in a worker-owned cooperative. Like, that's what he does, right? And, and there are a, a huge amount of our economy. Gar Garl Purvitz is somebody who's really good on this. His work talks about all the parts of our economy right now that are functioning as cooperatives, working for the social good. So we need to build on that, not just because sort of practical reasons, but also for intellectual reasons, like for us to be able to imagine and vision that as a possibility and say to others, Actually, it works. Like, all my bread comes from a worker-owned cooperative. People who work there are happy doing that work. Uh, somebody from more to the back, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, yeah. Just building on the gentleman's question and, and kind of maybe playing on the riff of management of home um, and, and Dorian's comment about the workplace as authoritarian. I guess I'm curious, could you talk a bit about how you see the home, like literally the family unit, um, which is changing rapidly, obviously, now. But uh, it occurs to me, actually, that I think as a parent of two young kids, I struggle daily with how to sort of embody a power sharing way of being, despite sort of the obedience relationship I have with my children. And I guess I'd be interested in hearing how you think about home, authoritarianism in the household, um, especially in patriarchal societies, and how that plays out more broadly. He kicked it to you. Um, cool. And, and no doubt, this is my man Brian Stout. Shout out to Brian. Let's get some um, non-male voices into the questions as well. Um, so I'll say that um, I think I think the management of home, and that's why we really like this idea around economy because it brings it back to your household. And I think that's our primary side of struggle. It's like in your actual interpersonal relationships. Like I can sit up here and say whatever I want to say. You know what I'm saying? Like y'all can think I'm a great guy and all these type of things, but what matters is what the people in my household think about me. And so if you really want to know who I am, you should ask them. But we don't usually do that, right? We usually like to have this persona, this public persona, and that's why men get away with so much terrible shit in front of, in front of public places and go home and be absolute monsters. So I think home is the, is the primary side of struggle for all of our relationships and how do we build things and how do we practice the kind of world we want to live in. Having a child is a tremendous gift. It's a tremendous opportunity. And I'll just say this. We have different cultural values around children in this country, right? Um, some people say children are to be seen and not heard. I don't believe that. I believe that children are sacred. I, I believe that children are a connection to our ancestors. I feel like they come here with, with the purpose to fulfill the work of the ancestors. So if you flip that script, then you can see like some of your child's, um, whatever you want to call it, uh, their um, disobedience as a moment to learn and to grow and to check yourself, right? Like, it's an interesting relationship because my son, he is not at the age, he's five, he cannot care for himself. That's facts. So I have to care for him. In order to care for him, I have to manage certain relationships that we have, certain things that we do, but I have to do it in a way that allows his humanity to be respected and allow him to blossom and grow. So that requires a lot of patience. That requires a lot of talking. That requires a lot of my ego to go away. And for me to remember, this is a young person that is developing. My son seems brilliant, but then I, I get reminded, wait, he doesn't know a whole bunch of different things, right? So, like, I can't, I can't really take that that way, right? Like, he said a certain thing to me, and it hurt my feelings, you know? But then I have to say, like, I can get mad at that, or I can say, hey, you know what? That hurt my feelings. I can also tell him sorry. How many parents tell their children, I'm sorry? That's power. That's about right relationship to power. You have the power in your household. It's not about having power or not having. It's about how you use it. So you can use it as a tool of upliftment and community and engagement, or you can use it to destroy people. But it's your choice. I'm going to call on you. So you actually just said it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. Yeah. <laughs>
you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I'd like to speak to both of these questions about that transition. I, I think that's probably the connection. I've been through lots of transitions. I remember when Dr. Martin Luther King was killed. I remember that day very specifically. But when you ask the question, the transition I think of the most profoundly is having a child. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's true.
internship uh, takeaways in school, I'm able to apply outside of the home. And so I think it's really important that we do take a look at critically how we are in our homes because there, you can really apply those to any relationship. And it's actually a, a really allowed a lot, a lot more fruitful relationships and a lot of uh, progress, I would like to say, and a lot of growth. So listening, I think, is a, a big takeaway. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you all for this. This is f fantastic. I really appreciate all your comments. I just want to say one thing that we say uh, at Moving Generation, transition is inevitable, justice is not. And we're interested in justice and a just transition, right? Um, I'd also say that um, to, the, to the relationship piece, uh, we are relational-based people, right? Like that's how we've evolved. Like we've evolved through cooperation. So it's actually in our DNA to seek cooperation. And it's easier work than oppression, right? So the easier thing for us to do is to cooperate. It's very hard to oppress another person. And it takes a lot, a tremendous amount of work that's going to leave you unhappy at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I just want to uh, offer those thoughts. Uh, I think the undercurrent of the, the whole conversation and probably a lot of the, the days we're together is power. Mm -hmm. And we're deeply uncomfortable with it. Um, we're uncomfortable with it for the right reasons when it's unjust. But power is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And we exercise it. And so we often are uncomfortable with how we exercise it. And I think the <laughs> it, it shows up in parenting and in schools. And I think we have to think of a different way to understand power. So I was just pulling up my favorite quote from Dr. King, which I'll share with you in a second. But I think my, my take on our uncomfortableness with power is how do we, you already said it, it's what we do with it as opposed to pretending like it's not there. Your p parents exercise power over your kids. You do. I have a puppy. I don't have a kid. <laughs> so I exercise a lot of power over my puppy, but but like we have to like figure like and so I, I often think of just the institution of family and the institution of schools. There is a teacher student relationship that is a relationship of power, and there is a parent child relationship that is a parent there is a relationship of power. We should always be suspicious of hierarchies and power relationships. Some are self liquidating. Mm -hmm. Some change. Did my mother have power over me growing up? Yes. I now care for her. I have power over her. Right? So it's changed over time. So I think we have to be more nuanced in how we talk about it. Um, but this is my favorite Dr. King quote. It's not from the I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> because he's talking about power. And he writes, some of you have heard this, power without love, you know this quote? Power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best, and this is where Cornel West gets this from, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. It's a different way to think about power. Yeah. power over your mother and I that sort of hit me with a little bit of resistance so is it that we're seeking maybe to dismantle domination power structures yeah. but we're actually bringing in competency power hierarchy perhaps mm -hmm. um, that there's a real difference between yeah. you know I as a parent have a competence that my children don't have yeah. and is there power in that? Absolutely, but it's not a, a power over structure, it's a power with. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think I'd like to use the word competency hierarchies um, that acknowledge that we proceed from something that came before us. And you kind of use that language, but in, in community organizing, they talk a lot about power over, power with, and power for, and I think that distinction is, is a little helpful in that too. So um, I want to go back to this um, idea around managing home and whatnot. I want to give you a concrete example of uh, some of the changes we can make, right? Like, I'm not, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not here to say, like, hey, all of these are individual choices that we need to make, and then that's going to get us to the revolution. Like, that's not the point of this, so don't take it that way. But we all are individual actors with a tremendous amount of power and ability to shape the world immediately around us, right? Um, I want to talk about money in the, in the family. 
Okay, I come from, I'm, I was born in Cleveland, Eastside. It's a very segregated place. My family is a family that has generational poverty. Some, some folks in the family might become homeowners or might not. So we have a lot of class disparity inside my family. Uh, and I've seen it play out in a lot of ways. It's a big family. My grandma had 13 kids. Everybody had at least two kids. It's like, I got like 50 first cousins that are like brothers and sisters. So y'all get it, y'all know, some of y'all know that, right? And so in my family, money is funny, right? And one of the things that really disappointed me and hurt me as I was growing up is that people saw me struggling and their response to that was, let me know if you need something. Let me know. Like, let's be real, I'm, I'm 13, 14, 15. Like expressing that I need something. I don't even, I might not even know what I need. You know, I'm still trying to figure certain things out, right? And so as I got older and I got uh, wiser and I started to experiment with solidarity economies, I started to experiment with some of the stuff we do at MG around non-extractive loan funds, I, I started a loan fund in my family. And the loan fund, it works just like this. We pull together money, me and like three of my cousins, we pull together money on a regular basis. And that money is available for anybody in our family. And they can come get it. It's like certain limits because we don't want to exhaust the fund. But if you need $100, no questions asked. We'll give it to you, period. You don't have to pay it back. We want you to pay it back so we can give it out to others. But if you need it, we got it and you have it. No strings attached. No interest. None of that shit. Now, you can't get no more until you pay it back, right? Because we don't want the fund to exhaust. But if you need something for 100 bucks, we got you. No questions asked. And you know that. You don't have to... You, we, you don't have to come and, hey, you know, maybe could you help me out? How much could you do? No, what we can do is this. We have this on the table for you right now, period. And so we want to start to break down these barriers and these relationships to resources. It's ridiculous. Like, there's so much power held in the resources in my family. Then they become about gender. They become about AIDS. They become about all these other things, judgment. Like, oh, well, you need $100, but last week I saw you at the club drinking some uh, vodka. Like, yeah, so fucking what? Like, you like vodka too. What the fuck is the problem? Like, that's not why I need $100. I need $100 because my brakes went out. Like, that ain't got nothing to do with vodka. And to be clear, I ain't even a drinker. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of people in my family are. And so anyway, I'm just trying to highlight, like, on a, on a, on a personal level, like, we can start making some of these changes in our family where we're just more compassionate to each other. You know? And we care for each other in different ways. But it's going to take a concerted effort. It's going to be uncomfortable. Um, but it's what we need, and it will be beautiful. That uncomfortability, that, that, that discomfort that you sit with through this transition, it's because what you're going to produce on the outside is beautiful. Like that analogy that you used, I saw my, I saw my wife go through pregnancy. I, I was there every day. I saw her body change. I saw the pain that she had. I was there at the labor in our house. I saw what she went through. What we got out of that situation, she says, I'll do that again in a heartbeat. Because it's beautiful. It hurt. But it was beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I want to just, because you've already asked, made a statement. I'm sorry. There's just a few people who haven't spoken. Yeah. Well, I've been working with communities. There's a community in Portugal that has been around for about 40 years. They work on holistic system change called Tamara. They work on patriarchy, patriarchy, capitalism, regenerative technologies. They don't work on white supremacy yet, although we're bringing it. Um, and that's a huge issue, like global white supremacy and how it underlies all the systems of change. And I feel like that goes pretty, you know, in a lot of places, in America and Europe, that conversation is really needed, connected to also resources. So I would say like white folks waking up is a huge piece that is ours to do. And in their, in their model over the last 40 years, they, when a child is born into the community, not only is the, like, the act of having a child a community decision, like like embedded in the community and blessed by the community, and also the child is then raised by the community in a way where they have, they really do have multiple trust relationships with different figures, and the women are liberated in a sense to be a part of the community work. So there's like thinking women and scientific women and all of it while they're raising their children are being supported by the men and the women in that community. And they also need to do more work on gender binary, I will say. So that's like the two critiques I bring. But what I've seen in that is that in liberating the resources of the feminine, in that birthing process, during a very vital time of women's like soul and power and life, like 30s to 50s to 60s, that time, then that power also gets to go into the community and goes, gets to go into visioning and actually like justice practices that come from a different place, the soul of the feminine. 
And so I've seen that work well, despite the critique. And I just wonder how we, in this society, can look at that. Yeah. Because I don't really want that private home anymore. You know, like I want to I wanna live with you all and be in a struggle with you all without those borders. Thank you. Can I, can I jump in on that? No, because I, I just want to say, and, and that's the last comment, by the way, and we'll just maybe just kind of go out with a little comment on that. You know, I really appreciate what you're saying, and I do think, as I had said earlier, that, that capitalism degrades leisure, right? Like, we're so stressed out, and we're so busy that we just, like, spend money to have a quick vacation or whatever, and that as you step outside of capitalism, as you're able to have you know, work less time in wage labor, you're able to do meaningful, important things that are like, you know, when you think about things like gardening, right, that some of us do as like a hobby or as fun, that are some things that other people do in a wage labor way, which is like devastatingly terrible labor. So, so much of what we have to do to kind of survive, if we do it in a non-capitalist way, it, it's, it's not like work leisure, it's like the richness and fullness of life, right? It's, it's, it's like a whole different frame. Over to you guys. Yeah. I'll do that and then you, we can go this way. Uh, so again, I think you have a lot more to say. <laughs> I love questions that are really like good contributions and arguments. Yes. So that's why I wanted a sister back there to elaborate. Um, so I'll just say, so I, let's, let's talk after because I, I want to know what, you, what you're thinking here. I would just say, um, let's keep in mind one important thing. This country has embraced for centuries the Protestant work ethic. That's a recent invention in human history. Mm -hmm. The Protestant work ethic is a really recent invention in human history. And we've taken it as like it's been here forever. It's normalized. So work, 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 no leisure. And then if we go back, you know, a couple centuries, right? Leisure was for the rulers. In feudal societies, the plebeians, other right, the workers and servants weren't allowed too much leisure. So th there was a value on leisure just for those who had the power. So how do we democratize leisure in a sense, so that we all have access and the power to uh, envision our own leisure, play, imaginations? Like that should that has to be part of the fight to transform capitalism. <laughs> And it can't be seen as separate, in my, in my view. Um, then just the last thing I'll just end on this, I, I mentioned the quote from my friend Natalie earlier, how rules and regulation is power frozen in a moment of time. And she reminded me, especially because we're here in the Bay Area and the Silicon Valley culture of problem solving and logic. And she reminded me that power eats logic for breakfast every morning. So yes, let's make the strongest, most logical arguments we can about all this stuff, but it all comes down to power. And how are we gonna build power to enact a different vision that's around solidarity and regeneration and all the things we've talked about? Can you get the last word in? Um, sheesh, I don't know, I mean, that was great. Um, I mean, I think this has been a great conversation. I wish we could talk more and do more, but um, I think one thing I would just say is that um, remain hopeful. You know, like you all are doing the work, you know, and that's the only way we're going to get out of this. And this is going to be a, a multi-generational effort. So please get out your mind that and, and any commitment to the change that you want to see in your life. Right. And if, you, if it's not here, then it's not working. We're failing. We're, it's not working. It's not working. We need long term, deep investment. These problems are not going to go away in grant cycles. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. 
So we have to get beyond that thinking and say, hey, I'm committed for the long term. We're going to work to fight the bad and we're going to build the new in a way that transforms our society. And I appreciate the comments that have been shared because um, part of what we must do is shift our worldview. That's the basis of all of it. We have to change the way we think about stuff. Uh, and we're going to be forced to change the way we think about stuff. Um, but we, we do have to change what we think and what we value and who we value and all of those great things. And so the good news is there's a lot of that to do. So we need everybody to do it. That's the, the beautiful thing about the management of home. You actually need everybody. In the village life, there's no such thing as unemployment. That's not natural. You need everybody to participate in order to have a high quality of life, period. Amen. All right. Thank you so much.